What's happening in the world of finance? The Intuition Finance Digest gives you a unique take on some of the industry's major trends. The announcement of new proposals, referred to as the Basel III endgame, to bring the regulatory capital framework in the United States into line with the final provisions of Basel III, is well-timed following well-publicized instances of the vulnerability of the U.S. banking sector earlier in the year. The global financial crisis of 2007 to 2009 demonstrated conclusively the impact that failure of individual banks can have on the stability of the global financial system, a phenomenon known as systemic risk. In particular, the crisis highlighted the fundamental role of capital adequacy in containing systemic risk. The response in the U.S. was increased capital requirements for large banking organizations to enable them to better absorb losses that threatened to disrupt financial intermediation in the economy. It was also expected that the resulting enhanced resilience of the banking sector would support more stable lending through the economic cycle, while reducing the possibility of fresh financial crises and their associated costs. These U.S. reforms to the regulatory capital framework were broadly consistent with an initial set of global standards published by the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision that followed the financial crisis. In line with the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act of 2010, the Federal Reserve also implemented capital planning and stress testing requirements for large bank holding companies and savings and loan holding companies. Additional capital buffer requirements were also imposed to mitigate the financial stability risks posed by U.S. global systemically important banks, as well as other enhanced prudential standards. Now, in a further tightening of the capital requirements regime, and informed by the experience since the crisis, the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency, the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System, and the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, collectively referred to as the agencies, have issued a notice of proposed rulemaking that proposes to modify the capital requirements applicable to banking organizations. These new rules apply to institutions with total assets in excess of 100 billion U.S. dollars and their subsidiary depository institutions and to banking organizations with significant trading activity. In 2019, the agencies adopted rules establishing four categories of capital standards for U.S. banking organizations with 100 billion U.S. dollars or more in total assets and foreign banking organizations with 100 billion U.S. dollars or more in combined U.S. assets. Here are the U.S. Capital Standards Bank categories. Category 1. U.S. Global Systemically Important Banks Holding Companies and Their Depository Institution Subsidiaries. Category 2. Banking Organizations with at least 700 billion U.S. dollars in total consolidated assets or at least 75 billion U.S. dollars in cross-jurisdictional activity and their depository institution subsidiaries. Category 3. Banking organizations with total consolidated assets of at least 250 billion U.S. dollars, or at least 75 billion U.S. dollars in weighted short-term wholesale funding, non-bank assets, or off-balance sheet exposure, and their depository institution subsidiaries. Category 4. Banking organizations with total consolidated assets of at least 100 billion U.S. dollars that do not meet the thresholds for a higher category, and their depository institution subsidiaries. Once again, the requirements under the proposed U.S. rulemaking are consistent with the Basel III reforms issued by the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision, BCBS, more specifically to the final changes published by the BCBS in December 2017 and the Market Risk Framework in January 2019. There are, according to the NPR, variations to reflect specific characteristics of U.S. markets, requirements under U.S. generally accepted accounting principles, or the GDAP practices of U.S. banking organizations, and U.S. legal requirements and policy objectives. As often is the case, the proposed changes involve elements of super-equivalence, which is essentially being tougher than the reforms published by the BCBS, despite the fact that the U.S. is represented on the BCBS and agreed to what the committee published. The same is true of the EU and the Bank of England, though not to the same extent as it would appear for the U.S., for example, in the case of credit risk, the proposal would effectively eliminate the use of banks' internal models to calculate regulatory capital requirements and in its place apply a simpler, standardized framework.
This would overcome a perceived lack of transparency and variability of results associated with internal models and enhance the ability of supervisors and market participants to make independent assessments of a bank's capital adequacy individually and relative to its peers. The Notice of Proposed Rulemaking, or NPR, notes that as the size and complexity of a financial institution increases, there are more opportunities for operational risk issues to emerge. Operational risk exposures have been, and continue to be, a persistent and growing risk for banks, with the proposal stating that the current models-based approach can produce estimates that exhibit substantial uncertainty and volatility, as well as a lack of transparency and comparability. To address this, the NPR proposes a simpler, standardized calculation. The global financial crisis saw banks incur significant losses in their trading books. Banks had long used internal value at risk, VAR, models for these positions, but the crisis highlighted how these models inadequately captured the risks. While the NPR retains banks' ability to use internal models for measuring market risk, it proposes replacing VAR with an expected shortfall, ES, methodology, that better accounts for potential losses. The use of internal models would also be subject to enhanced requirements for model approval and ongoing performance testing. The NPR also includes a standardized measure for market risk that is risk-sensitive and provides comparability across banking organizations. Banks may elect to use this rather than the models-based approach. Those that do not receive approval to use the models-based measure would be required to use the standardized measure. Counterparty credit risk, CCR, associated with financial derivatives is dealt with by the introduction of standardized approaches for credit valuation adjustment, CVA, risk. This refers to potential mark-to-market losses on derivatives transactions resulting from the credit risk of the counterparty. During the global financial crisis, CVA risk was a major source of losses on banks' derivatives portfolios. The NPR aims to streamline regulatory capital calculations by applying requirements more consistently across large banking organizations. To this end, the applicability of several aspects of the current rules have been expanded to apply to all categories of bank. Significantly, the proposal would include Category 3 and Category 4 banks, generally those with between 100 and 700 billion U.S. dollars in total assets, into much of the capital framework already applicable to the very largest banks, Category 1 imposing substantial regulatory adjustment costs on those smaller organizations. This is likely a response to issues highlighted by the failure of Silicon Valley Bank earlier this year. The impact of the NPR, should it be implemented as proposed, would vary meaningfully by institution, depending on each banking organization's activities and risk profile. Some estimates suggest that it would increase common equity Tier 1 capital requirements by as much as 16% for holding companies, and 9% for insured depository institutions. According to the FDIC, the majority of banks that would be subject to the proposed rule currently have enough capital to meet the proposed requirements, and large banking organizations identified as having shortfalls currently would be able to achieve compliance through earnings over a short time frame, even while maintaining their dividends. The proposed changes would be phased in over a three-year transition period with any final rule not expected to take effect until July 1, 2025. Taking the effective date and transition period together, the capital requirements under a final rule would not be fully effective until the second half of 2028. Intuition Know How, the world's premier digital learning solution for finance, has a number of tutorials relevant to the content of this podcast, including An Introduction to Basel III, Global Financial Crisis Causes, Impact, and Legacy, an introduction to operational risk, and many more. To learn more about know-how, please visit intuition.com forward slash know-how today.